Um, I would now like to ask um, Oliver Cox, who is um, from the Oxford University Heritage Network. And I've, um, known Oxford, uh, I've known Oliver now for a few years and he was just starting it out when we first met and it has grown so much. I mean, it's really fantastic what you have done and how you engage with so many different stakeholders and communities. So it's really an inspiration, Oliver. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much indeed, Mimi, and um, thank you to the colleagues who have presented so far. Really fascinating stuff, so hopefully I can contribute in some uh, small way to our discussion today. Um, well, it's very nice to be coming to you live from South London, um, uh, and in particular the London borough of Lambeth, where I haven't left for about six months. I'm desperate, desperate to leave my spare room to actually visit the historic house. It's a year to the day since my last visit to stow landscape gardens on the outskirts um, of, um, uh, uh, of Oxford. So what I want to do in my 15 minutes today is reflect on the current position of historic houses in the UK and then share some thoughts as to why I think collaboration with universities is so vital for historic houses that open to the public. And I'll end my presentation by sharing a few examples of projects up and down the country that give you a sense of what's possible when universities and historic houses find that sweet spot for collaborating. So hopefully you can all see my slides moving along. Um, let me take you right back to the heady days of 2019. The UK's historic house sector was in rude health. Indeed, it was the most popular year ever in terms of visitors, um, in terms of visitors to historic houses across Britain. In 2019, 26.8 million people visited the 1,500 member houses of historic houses. And that's the body that represents those houses still in private ownership, um, uh, which is more than the total number of international visitors to Japan. The National Trust welcomed over 28 million people to its pay for entry sites. And since the year 2000, its membership has grown by 120% from 2.7 million to 5.95 million people. And it's worth recalling that that is more than the membership, the combined membership of every single political party in the UK combined. And thinking about the roots of this massive growth, one aspect is the significant infrastructure investment made by heritage organizations into what I like to call the holy trinity of heritage. That's toilets, car parks, and cafes, which ensure a baseline quality to any visit. But this investment in the Holy Trinity has been paralleled by com comparable investment in exciting and engaging programming and the significant repositioning of the historic house as a family visitor attraction. So this means that with over 50 million visits to historic houses a year in the UK, these spaces and places are of huge significance in sharing Britain's history with both domestic and global audiences. Well, then 2020 happened. Um, and I don't, you know, <laughs> need to share with you all the fact that 2020 was the worst year for the museum and cultural heritage sector since the Second World War. Lockdown and other COVID restrictions significantly impacted upon historic houses' ability to open. Interiors not suitable to social distancing, unlike some museums, due to the dense furnishings and inability to allow free flow. Volunteers drawn from an age group that are most at risk from the virus had a disastrous impact on organizations' finances. The National Trust, the largest single operator of historic houses in the UK, will lose and has predicted to lose in the region of £200 million last year. Now, some of this financial impact has been mitigated through the UK government's cultural recovery fund. And interestingly, 
taxpayers' money has been made available to private owners. Blenheim Palace, for example, received £1.8 million to help fund a major new feature within the historic stables and provide a, his a fully accessible route to the formal gardens for the first time. So if there was the financial threat, the second aspect for heritage organisations opening country houses to the public was the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the reanimation of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is brought to the fore both in terms of organisational strategies and press attention, activities concerned with active decolonization of collections and inherited historical narratives. In particular, this activity has and will continue to focus on the need to make visible change in the way in which collection items associated with the histories of enslavement and colonialism are interpreted. And this is an opportunity made more difficult by the financial apocalypse of 2020 and the likely slow revival of domestic and international tourism. The financial, these financial implications, I would suggest, are of grave significance for public history. Organizations forced to cut project costs and curatorial budgets will need to prioritize those projects that have the potential for direct commercial return, which in the current environment might put a worlding of the British historic house somewhat towards the back of the queue. But despite all of this, I want to remain optimistic. So here are a couple of the, um, the recent, um, uh, recent bits of um, sort of political discussion about the country house. I want to remain optimistic because I do think it remains a hugely exciting time for university and historic house collaborations. Partnerships can be of all different scales and sizes from individual students choosing to volunteer with particular organizations through to multi-year funded formal collaborations with multiple academics and researchers. And it's important to stress at the outset that these collaborations are not just about historical research. What's so striking about the opportunity with historic houses is just how broad the range of topics it is possible to explore are. Um, and I just want to give you three examples of current projects that we're working on in Oxford. Colleagues of mine at the Oxford Robotics Institute are testing their driverless cars in the wider estate at Blenheim Palace. Now, I'm no scientist, but from what I could understand, the cars were very good at going in a straight line, but not so good at dealing with curves and undulations. So it turns out that a capability to br uh, brown designed landscape is a pretty ideal test ground. Secondly, colleagues at the Oxford Resilient Buildings Laboratory are developing a new lime mortar toolkit for historical buildings and historic buildings with the aim of reducing repair costs and increasing the effectiveness of lime mortar. And at Chatsworth House in Derbyshire, we've developed a multi-year partnership to provide paid internships for Oxford students to spend the summer with the collections team at Chatsworth, um, creating both new um, academic articles, but also thinking really carefully about the ways in which that new research is uh, translated and transmitted to a whole range of different audiences. Now, how are these projects funded? The first of these, is part of a major multi-million pound research project funded by the Department of Transport in the UK. The second is supported by Government Research Council investment in heritage science. And the third is funded by the university. I do think that despite the, the flowering of research activity, there remain substantial challenges in how new historical information might be both accessed and interpreted within the historic house context. Relevant research in scholarly journals often sits behind a paywall, making it inaccessible to staff and volunteers at historic houses who cannot justify the subscription fees. So I commend to you in this respect, the Paul Mellon Center's recently launched Art and the Country House Project, 
which is an example of what is possible through open access online publication. So there are some fantastic, um, you know, richly peer reviewed um, and detailed scholarly essays. Um, I've written a couple, so do read them. Oh, they're great. But no, really read other colleagues' uh, uh, contributions, which are far more erudite uh, and engaging than mine. Um, so what I think links together these three projects and the fourth, which I've just shared with you here, um, is a commitment to a set of three core values that underpin all of our collaborative work in the University of Oxford. Knowledge, credibility, and inventiveness. So what our researchers do is bring a deep knowledge of the subject to a project. This in turn gives the outcomes an enormous amount of credibility. The two provide the foundation for us to be inventive in the way in which we work with our partners. This is as true for historians as it is for computer scientists, as it is for ecologists. And the feedback loop depends on the quality of the content. What we aim for is something I call triple A content. That's content that's accurate, authentic, and most importantly of all, accessible. So what we look to do um, through collaboration at the University of Oxford is unlock stories. We're experts, we're, we're innovators, but most importantly, we're partners. We want to celebrate the connections between our people, our, part of, our partners, and the collections that they hold. So in the final part of my talk, I just want to take things back to basics for a minute and consider some of the reasons why universities might be interested in working with historic houses. It's important in that case to remember the core purpose of universities. We exist to advance the world's knowledge and communicate these findings to as wide a range of audiences as possible. As such, the historic house is a treasure trove of research opportunities. It provides the historian with bundles of manuscripts, the environmental scientist with a rich landscape full of data, and the social scientist with all sorts of different people to research. Most excitingly, the historic house is a setting where it is possible to connect ideas to place. I believe that it is the place and setting that has the potential to bring relevance and meaning to abstract concepts. And you know, ultimately, universities want to support research into the big ideas behind special places. Secondly, the historic house community is full of expertise. For universities, there's an enormous incentive to work with expertise that exists outside the higher education sector. A two-way exchange of knowledge makes the end product richer, more reliable, and more resilient. The experience of heritage practitioners, curators, conservators, historic house owners, and managers can create an important dialogue with, heritage educa with higher education, helping to broaden and inform the views of academics and students. Thirdly, we want to produce engaging and most importantly, employable students. Working with historic houses not only gives students an important dose of the real world, it also sharpens up their skills in a whole variety of different areas. As a consequence, universities invest heavily in student placements, internships and training programs. Um, so, you know, I, and, and as Mimi has done, I'd suggest to reach out to those departments and work with them to develop projects. It's fantastic that a number of uh, Oxford University micro interns are supporting uh, this week's activities. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we want to engage wider non-specialist audiences with our research. One of the most important determinants of the amount of funding that universities receive in the UK is something called impact. Publicly funded research is required to have social, cultural and economic benefit. And it's my firm belief that the best way to achieve that is to work in partnership. So the key to successful partnership is mutual benefit. And in order to develop and identify these areas of mutual benefit, I think that takes time. Don't rush it. Explore the, each other's aims, ambitions and motivations. This is the part of the collaboration that takes the most time. It's important to build trust, but also, crucially, 
to develop a shared language. So with that in mind, I'd say that working with a university is not necessarily a quick fix solution. We're complicated, slow moving, lumbering beasts. We work on different time scales to most commercial organizations and have very long lead in times for projects. So my advice is to start the conversation as early as possible. And I wanted to conclude by just sharing a couple of um, current projects that we're uh, embarking on and have embarked upon um, at the university over the past few years using a type of funding that's available in the UK called a collaborative doctoral award. These are scholarships that pay for a research that, that pay a researcher an annual salary to complete a PhD in partnership with an organization outside of academia. Um, and my team in Oxford has a great track record of creating these opportunities, but they do take a long period of time to gestate. So here's one we're now two and a half years into, which is a, um, a history of the Historic Houses Association, exploring all of the, the significant uh, role that taxation uh, reform plays in the preservation of um, historic houses from 1950 to the present day. And then more broadly, our, our, our work around historic houses at the moment has is focusing you know, very much on the broader global histories and global resonances of these places. So we have a project on West Indian absentee slaveholding. Um, we've got well, an anthropology um, project on photographs of empire in country house collections. Um, and we're in the process of recruiting for a PhD exploring class, art, and the influences of British India at Bateman's, Rudyard Kipling's family home. So I hope that whistle-stop tour has given you a sense of the what is possible through collaboration with universities. And one area where I feel universities can be especially helpful for historic houses is to act as a critical friend. In the past few years of working with privately owned properties in the UK, I've noticed a reticence or indeed a fear of opening up archives or of showing paintings and, and, and objects to academic researchers. This is especially true when it comes to questions regarding the origins of wealth. There is, I would argue, fantastic challenging research that increasingly links country houses to imperial wealth, including slavery. So what I try to say to owners of such properties worried about these links is that you have to own them now. You have to get ahead of the narrative and work with partners to explore and explain those histories. Most importantly, I feel we need to be honest and open in sharing the full history of these homes. And I'd like to think that organizations that commit to that will gain respect in return. Thanks ever so much for your time uh, this evening, this morning, and this afternoon. Absolutely fascinating, Oliver. Thank you so much. I'd love to start the conversation right away because the Indian context, of course, is, is very different. And we also have a history of slavery, not necessarily of African slavery, but um, you know, enslaved labor in India. And there's also the idea of um, auspiciousness. So if you want to, um, if you are the owner your conversation might be very different from an academic conversation because if you are an owner and you depend on weddings and there's a history of you know slavery or, or you know abuse associated with the building you are never going to do any wedding there because of this indian concept of auspiciousness so there are many different kind of challenges in the in the indian context for example but uh, we'll, we'll discuss that later thank you so much and one thing i wanted to mention that really really intrigued me also oliver before our um, event uh, when you actually mentioned that you were heading to India virtually. And I thought it was really, really lovely because we have all of these webinars with people from all over the world and we don't, we don't remember anymore. We don't think about the place. And this was the first time that someone actually brought up the place. And I think it's, uh, it's really lovely we that we have this kind of knowledge of you know, being in India at the moment, having partners from the US, from England and being here together to discuss this. So thank you very much.